Hello, everyone. Today I will be presenting the introduction for our group project, Auditory Accessibility, by Mars Hutchkins, Yojin Han, Torin Corrigenero, Yatishka Walton, Jonathan Montalvo Colon, and Tiffany Melodo. Auditory Accessible Technology, AAT, also known as Hearing Assistive Technology, HAT, is any technology that is accessible to individuals who have issues hearing, whether they have loss of hearing or are legally deaf. This allows for individuals who would not be able to use such a product to be able to enjoy the same products everyone else is using with tools to assist them specifically. According to HLAA, Hearing Loss Association of America, assistive listening systems and devices bridge the gap between you and the sound source by eliminating the effects of distance, background noise, and reverberation. Since every individual auditory disabilities vary according to the type and extent of their disability, developers have added programming that is more accessible for them, such as providing transcripts for audio-only content and providing both captions and transcripts for multimedia and video with audio content. With that being said, the, the National Institution of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, NIDCD, funds research into several areas of assistive technology, such as improved devices, for people with hearing loss, improved devices for non-speaking people, more natural synthesized speech, and brain-computer interface research. The four types of assistive technology for individuals who are hard of hearing or deaf are alerting, are alerting devices, telecommunications, enhanced assistive listening, and captioning. He fully states the five ways to make a site accessible for individuals who have trouble hearing are accurate captions, adding transcripts, multiple methods of contact and communication, high quality, clear audio with minimal background noise, and use of clear and simple language. Hello, my name is Tiffany Meldow, and I'm here to talk about the history of audio accessibility. History hasn't always been so kind to those who are deaf or hard of hearing. According to StartASL.com, Aristotle's theory was that people were only able to learn through spoken language, therefore deaf people weren't able to be educated. This led to those who were deaf being denied basic rights, such as being able to get married or own property. Michael W. Davidson, in his biography on the Italian mathematician and physician Girolamo Cardano says that Girolamo was the first recorded in history to openly challenge the belief that the deaf couldn't be educated in the 1500s. The Renaissance was just the beginning of accessibility being offered to those who are deaf, as opposed to treating them like they've treated the mentally disabled, as they've done in the past. According to Dr. Carol Miller in her essay on historical perspectives on deafness, it wasn't until after World War II when American Sign Language became scientifically established as a true language. Prior to this, oralism, or communicating through speech and lip reading, was the main method of language for the deaf. A deaf engineer named Robert Weybrecht developed a communication device known as a teletypewriter in the 1960s. This allowed for those who were deaf to be able to communicate through type messages from long distances, according to Harvard's Deaf History Timeline. Between the 1970s and 1980s began the early usage of both live and pre-recorded captioning for television viewers. The National Cap Captioning Institute states that by the 1990s, many more pre-recorded and live programs are captioned, including primetime series, movies, home videos, and other nightly newscasts, morning news programs, political debates, and a myriad of sporting events, including the Super Bowl and Olympics. The 1990s also celebrated the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which prohibited the discrimination of disabled people in all areas of public life, such as employment. This opened up many opportunities for those with disabilities to be able to have access to the same opportunities as others. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yujin Han, and I'm going to talk to you about the overview research of auditory accessibility. 
A little over 5% of world population has a hearing loss ability according to the World Health Organization. There are different types of hearing impairments like conductive hearing loss, which is when the sound is muffled. Perceptive deafness is when the sound is distorted. Crawling tinnitus is when you hear a crackling noise with the sound that you hear from an external source. And whistling tinnitus is a whistling noise when the sound that you hear from an external source. Ways to design that will help with auditory accessibility is to provide transcripts and captions from whenever you use a sound or video content. For example, some YouTube videos will have a transcript that will go with the video. You also see a lot of sign language used in interpretation on news and conferences. One of the studies that was conducted regarding auditory accessibility is by Brent Shiver and Rosalie Wolf, evaluating alternatives for better death accessibility to selected web-based multimedia. They focused on users who were born deaf or became deaf at an early age. 20 people were interviewed about the usage and the frustration of using the internet, while the second study, 95 people assesses different caption styles like auto-generated caption. Some use color-coded captions to highlight the confidence levels. However, they were not beneficial, but they still favor the concept of color coding. From another case study by Miko Namatame, Makoto Kabayashi, Akita Harada, when using pictures, they should express the contents accurately, use concrete objects, use photographs of goods and suitable icons. For text, they should be accompanied with pictures, and in their case for Japanese, avoid using English and katana notations and menus. According to the Assessing the Accessibility of Assistive Technology for the Death Case Study, those people with hearing impairments have benefited from advances in technology that improve hearing and support texting of any kind. Automated captioning is improving while language translation between spoken and sign languages is far from ideal. Including captions and language translation for web accessibility is still basically up to the web designers. The amount of multimedia on the web is growing rapidly. Currently, information on the web is visually oriented, but we may be in the silent movie era of the web. Should multimedia become dominant on the web, automated ways to achieve accessibility for people with hearing impairments become imperative because no one should be denied access to the abundance of information that the internet has to offer. A summary of developments in auditory accessibility. Over the past few years, technology has been implemented into daily life in many various ways, including how we consume media, be it for the news, education, work, or entertainment. Once more, the past few years and even now in cases, many developments made to allow that media to be made accessible to everyone, including those who are deaf or otherwise hard of hearing. According to Miki Namatame, one of the largest issues presented is the use of video or multimedia to present information, be it vital or additive, without captions, text, or a text alternative. This issue leads to the presented information being inaccessible to those in the deaf community, as well as those who are hard of hearing, have auditory processing issues, aren't familiar with the spoken language, or otherwise need text alternatives to consume the information. As edited and documented by Ben Caldwell and many others involved, in response to this and other issues like it, the Web Accessibility Initiative created the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, a set of guidelines made to address, solve, and prevent issues with accessibility in online media and content. There also exists the Rehabilitation Act, a federal act which, as highlighted by Shiver and Wolf, in Section 508 requires that all electronic and information technology made and used by U.S. federal agencies to be made accessible to people with disabilities. Because of the development of guidelines and requirements such as these, 
it's become far more common to see videos in media that have captions and transcripts. This includes YouTube, which, in 2009, saw the addition of captions that could be created automatically through Google's automatic speech recognition technology, which could automatically recognize and caption languages spoken in time with the videos, as unveiled and discussed in Google's article, Automatic Captions in YouTube. This development meant most videos with spoken dialogue would be automatically captioned, which is a big step towards accessibility to the deaf community. However, there are still some improvements to be made with this addition, as there are often errors with the ASR technology recognizing words, accents, and even entire languages when the captions are not manually created by the video's creator, which it's sadly quite often that they're not, as discussed by Shiver and Wolf. YouTube is just one of many examples of websites and online content affected by the guidelines and requirements set towards creating greater accessibility on the web to include those in the deaf community, as well as anyone else who benefits from the additions of text alternatives. As noted by Miki Namatame and many others, more official sites are more likely to use manually created captions, video transcripts, and other text alternatives for videos, images, and other media that deliver important or additive information online. A general statement to be made is that while many developments have been made in aiding to provide accessibility, there is still a large amount that can be done to improve where said improvements are lacking. Hello, my name is Torn Christian Rao, and this is my explanation of future developments in auditory accessibility design. When improving upon the past developments of auditory accessibility in web design, <coughs> One of the most crucial and growing concerns is that the design meets the necessary requirements. The reason why this issue is becoming more prominent over time is due to the growing complexity of easily accessible technology. Sang Yu stated in an article that a heavy amount of evaluation is used when ensuring that the design's accessibility and functionality will match with the targeted user's requirements and that even a simple audio accessibility function needs to undergo many cycles of design before it's functionally capable of supporting the needs of anyone with audio disability. Despite the complexity of easily accessible devices, they also pose a major benefit when applying audio accessible features. Advancements in technology such as smartphones have made it possible to use features that would normally only be accessible through auditory medical devices onto an everyday portable device. Swain Poole stated in an article that future alternatives using smartphone apps informed by results from an app-based test could turn the smartphone into an accessible intervention device for amplification or assistive listening. Explaining how devices from only 10 years prior could only, could only be distributed as listening devices alone that couldn't be updated via software and were more, mostly inaccessible price. Not only do these new features display how they can be used for those with auditory disability, but also anyone who wants to have a new perspective on what listening can be. An example of this is an audio software design that was meant to help people with auditory disabilities visualize sound better. What was in researching how people who uh, would react to the design was that people without disabilities could socialize with those with audio disabilities without any communication barrier. When discussing this new concept at the Sound and Music Computing Conference, Frederick Bevilacqua stated that these technologies would open new opportunities for the exploration of intertwined sonic and social interactions, not only for people with disabilities, but for anyone willing to participate. Because of advancements such as these, I believe the future of auditory accessibility is one that can, everyone can equally benefit from and enjoy together. Incorporation of Accessible Design I would like to talk about the incorporation of accessible design that we used in our project. According to Brent Shiver and Rosalie Wolf, most people preferred captions and transcript to follow along. So we added our captions exactly to the clear audio to give a better understanding. In reaching web accessibility guidelines for the hearing impaired case study states, even if we had clear images and knew what the image was, text should be added under every image describing the image which we had included. 
Color contrast of our design is important because the visual for the users to see shouldn't be so hard to read or see along with having bullet points short and simple so it doesn't cluster your eyes. Assessing the accessibility of assessive technology for the deaf includes readable font and text size to support texting of any kind. We have included our transcript along with our PowerPoint and the listing of our work cited down in the description below. Thank you.